Hey there, history buffs. Today, let's dive into a topic that has shaped societies for centuries, the invention of race. Believe it or not, the concept of race as we know it is relatively new. It was crafted in the 17th century and officially brought into law around 1681 in Virginia. Surprising, right? Before this pivotal moment, African slaves in Virginia were initially treated as indentured servants. They toiled side by side with their European counterparts. Both groups shared similar living conditions and, at times, even intermarried. But then, something happened that changed the course of history. Enter Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. Led by Nathaniel Bacon, this armed rebellion saw both black and white indentured servants band together against the ruling class. This unity terrified the elite. They realized that a united lower class posed a significant threat to their power, so they devised a cunning strategy to divide and conquer. The elite began to entrench the idea of race into society. They passed laws that distinguished between European and African laborers. Africans were relegated to lifelong slavery while Europeans were granted freedoms after their period of servitude. This legal divide created a racial hierarchy that pitted poor whites against Africans, ensuring they would never unite against the ruling class again. The invention of race was a calculated move to maintain power and control. It sowed seeds of division that would grow and impact societies for centuries to come. This strategic division didn't just stop in Virginia. It spread like wildfire throughout the colonies and later the entire world. The concept of race became a tool of oppression and a means to justify the exploitation of African slaves. The ruling class used race to manipulate perceptions, turning potential allies into adversaries. They fostered fear and mistrust, ensuring that unity among the masses remained a distant dream. So, when you think about the origins of race, remember that it was a construct designed to divide us. Understanding this history is crucial in recognizing the patterns of division that persist today. It's a sobering reminder of how power can manipulate and shape societal structures, but it's also a call to action. By learning from the past, we can challenge these divisions and work towards a more united and inclusive future. Thanks for tuning in, History Buffs. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more deep dives into the stories that shaped our world. Until next time, stay curious. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media. This is Yeshi Yahoo, where we address the problems of a modern world. Stay tuned, we have an awesome show for you today. The birth of race, a 17th century strategy. What does the Bible say about this? Topics covered, the birth of race, and the 70 nations, and then our summary. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most of all, enjoy the show, you might just learn something. Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. The birth of race. So so here's what we know. We we know that for the from the moment the English first sought to colonize in North America, mm -hmm. for 100 years from that point, from the Roanoke attempt, there is not a single reference for 100 years to anyone called a white person, not in mm -hmm. law, not in records, mm -hmm. right? So then all of a sudden, um, beginning for the first time in 1681, there, there begins to be a reference to a whole new group of humanity called white people. Well, so the question becomes how, when, where, and why? Like mm -hmm. lawmakers are like the rest of us. We, you know, we don't tend to go about um, creating something that requires effort unless it's to serve a purpose. Um, and there's a couple interesting things to note. First of all, before the very first assertion in law of anybody called a white person, the treatment of people of African descent and people of European descent who were indentured servants 
it, if they worked on the same plantation, their lives were the same. They were treated the same. They worked together, they ate together, they slept together. Um, what began to emerge uh, around 1640, but even then it was by far the exception, was that um, some people of African descent began to be claimed as indentured for life or enslaved, uh, which would be our language. But that was, again, the exception, not the rule. Um, and Leon Bennett Jr.'s work is really terrific uh, yeah. to, to capture this because he, of course, was writing um, against these white historians who were articulating that the first people of African descent forced to the shores of Virginia were were enslaved. But what Lerone Bennett's work shows, because and he practically takes a picture and puts it in a chapter, he shows that if you look at the records at the plantation, the people of African descent are listed as servants alongside the Europeans who were held mm -hmm. on the plantation. And we also know that um, only because I've dug into the research about two of those mm -hmm. people is that within five years, they were married. You couldn't be married if you were um, in, indentured. Um, and so the presumption, the fair assumption is that they were free and then they gave birth to a child, which was punishable um, if you were indentured and their child, there was no punishment meted out and the child was, uh, William was, mm -hmm. um, baptized in the Church of England. So you have all of these historical clues that really suggest significantly that people of African descent and European descent were similarly treated. And furthermore, once um, persons of African descent uh, were free, were no longer bound by a term of indenture, they had the same rights and privileges as an Englishman. They could vote, they could run for public office, and they did. Mm -hmm, <laughs> there there mm -hmm. were African American men who held public office. Um, they could own land, and they did. They could own European indentured servants. They could own um, African indentured servants, and they did. All of those things in the historical right. record. And so, then what happened? Right? Obviously, something something significant happened, and what the historical record suggests is that um, this massive rebellion called Bacon's Rebellion that engulfed the colony of Virginia for over a year. Right. Yeah, that, that it is after that rebellion, again, I think it's really important for people, it's not some week long or a couple day rebellion, like mm -hmm. it was well over a year, um, that the English ruling elite were absolutely, um, you know, horrified, traumatized by this. And they, the work of historian Theodore Allen digs into letters going back and forth between the legal oversight authority in London and the ruling elite in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And the Virginia ruler said, hey, look, oversight authority in London, don't worry about this. We have it under control. And they indicated that they were going to pursue a divide and conquer strategy. And it is on the heels of that that we see bundles and bundles of laws getting passed that that took the laboring class and now divided us mm -hmm. into those called white laborers and and they didn't do much even on the front end to lift up those white laborers in terms of giving them a pence or resources right what they did was they dug out a new bottom to colonial society and mm -hmm. tossed people of African descent and indigenous people into that pit. And we've been living with that social structure ever since. The 70 nations, according to the Bible. So before I do this little reading here, I want to talk about that a little bit. So the concept of race is a social construct. And it came pretty much after um, Bacon's rebellion. Now, the concept of race itself was developed. Uh, I mean, it, people differ on the origin exactly, but uh, most people say it was developed in Germany where they started looking at the different people groups and they took a very generic um, very 
almost meaningless uh, um, thing, for lack of a better word, uh, as skin color to kind of start dividing up people. But there was a there was a, a rhyme to the reason or a reason to the rhyme. It, it was being developed at a time where slavery was starting to become a big thing. And so what, what, what it was doing was tantamount to, hey, we have to decide, uh, you know, by, it was actually originally by papal bull. If you don't know what a papal bull is, it's basically um, when the Pope uh, issues a decree. So basically, at the start of the transatlantic slave trade, the Pope issued a papal bull saying that anybody basically uh, below the Sahara Desert could be enslaved. So that's how the transatlantic slave trade starts. So it's the Roman Catholic Church that initiates this thing. And so uh, if you were a Moor, you weren't enslaved. If you were a Muslim, you weren't enslaved. But anybody below this, what, what we call today, colloquially, as the sub-Saharan peoples, they could be enslaved as infidels, basically. And so that's how it kind of starts. But when the Portuguese start bringing slaves to the Americas, to, to what they call the Brazils, um, there was a, a British privateer ship called the White Lion that intercepted a slave ship, a Portuguese slave ship, and that was the beginning of slavery being brought to the Americas. So that British privateer ship brought the, that confiscated cargo, which were slaves, brought them to Virginia. And so how that, that's how that gets started. So... I mean, there's a lot to think about here. Um, just the fact that the, even to this day, um, black people in America are called, you know, Negroes. Well, that's not an English word. That's a Portuguese word. Or you could say even Spanish, right, or Italian. But it's, it's really a Portuguese word. So black people in America have a Portuguese moniker because... And that's, that'll be the focus of another video, but <laughs> that's because of how this whole process started. So black people in America have a Portuguese moniker, and that's very important to understanding who the African, what the so-called African-American is, you know, from his uh, ancestry. But... If you can go through the Bible cover to cover and it never talks about race, what it does talk about is ethnicity or what I call tribal ethnicity um, and pretty much who you're descended from de determines who you are. So they talk about the 70 nations, the 70 tribal nations, and it starts something like this in Genesis chapter 10 verse 2 the sons of Japheth Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras and it says by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands every one after his tongue after their families in their nations so the scriptures mention uh, the children of Japheth first. And they were called Gentiles. In fact, it's, it's kind of interesting that only they were called Gentiles. So the children of Japheth were first called Gentiles. The children of Ham were not called Gentiles, nor were the children of Shem called Gentiles. Now, that's, that's deep because today when you think of the term Gentiles, you're thinking pretty much of, oh, everybody who's not an Israelite. But that's not what it said in the beginning. It called the children of Japheth Gentiles, the peoples of the nations who inhabited the isles, right? 
And if you know, if you go to the book of uh, Jubilees, it talks about after the flood, the sons of uh, of Noah getting together and uh, making a pact, a covenant, where they divided the earth into three parts. And the north lands were given to Japheth. And the middle lands was to Shem. And the south lands was to Ham. And so it was a covenant. And, and then they told Noah, and, and it was kind of ratified at that moment. And I'm not going to dig into it right now, but Canaan reneged on his deal. <laughs> Canaan decided, I'm going to take Shem's land. And uh, his brothers told him not to do it because it would bring a curse upon him, which it did. And he would, re- you know, basically he would re- regret it, which he did. So the children of Canaan, or Canaan, um, later on were cursed by Noah. This wasn't done in a vacuum. Canaan did uh, what was unthinkable. He claim jumped. He took Shem's land, land and uh, he paid the price for it. So he was cursed for it. So here in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, and these are the sons of Ham, Cush and Mitzlam and Put and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Rama and Sabteca, and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan, and Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So the Southlands were given to the children of Cush. And I believe Cush means something on the order of sun, sun blackened. So basically denoting his skin tone, I, I would guess. So the dark skinned peoples of, of the earth. But if you go to, uh, as a side note, if you go to the Zondervan's uh, Bible Dictionary, it says that Ham is the progenitor of the, uh, basically the black races, but not the Negro. So it was even understood at that time that there was a difference between Negroes and Hamites. And remember I said the term Negro is a Portuguese term. So like I said, I'm not going to get into it now, but that, that term Negro was placed on a people that lived on what we now call the Iberian Peninsula. And the term Iberian, remember, um, well, well, we'll talk about it when we get to Shem, but Iberian means something. And so these Negroes of the Iberian Peninsula were enslaved and brought to West Africa. And there's so much written about that, and it's never taught in any schools. And there's a reason it's not taught in any schools, because uh, there's a great heritage (laughs) that's uh, not talked about. So here we're looking at the sons of Ham. So Cush, and of course, Mitzrayim is is actually Egypt. And Mitzrayim means captivity, besieged a rocky place, you know? And so when you see Egypt mentioned, it means slavery. It, that's exactly what it means. Um, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 22. Now we're going to talk about the children of Shem. And the children of Shem are Elam and Asher and Arpaxed and Lud and Aram. And Arpaxed begat Salah and Salah begat Eber. Now in Hebrew, it's only three letters. And it's, it's pronounced Eber. Today, in, in English, we say Hebrew. But in, in the actual Hebrew language, it's Eber. And so we would actually call the Hebrew people, we would call them the Ibarim. Im. That's like adding the letter S at the end of a word. It denotes plurality, basically. More than one. So Eber, or the Ibarim, are descended from Eber. So the Hebrews, that term Hebrew means to cross over, and it's derived from the progenitor Eber. 
And so, and I'm going to do a video on it. That's why I didn't want to give it away, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you. You know, they call the, uh, where Spain and Portugal are, they call it the Iberian Peninsula. Now, there are two places on Earth that are called Iberia. And one of them is the Iberian Peninsula. And if you notice, there are the Jews um, were the richest people in or on the Iberian Peninsula prior to the Reconquisto, which was when uh, the Moors were driven out by the by the Knight El Cid. Um, it's a long story, and that's a, it's a lot to talk about. I won't talk about it here, but basically. It's, it was called the, we say Iberian Peninsula, but it's funny because the Romans call it the Hebarian Peninsula because the Iberian Peninsula means the peninsula of the Hebrews. And there's another location called Iberia or Iberia, which is around the Caucasus Mountains, and it's, it's very interesting that those two locations who were found in those two locations in, in mass. You have the Jews of Spain and Portugal in the Iberian or Iberian Peninsula. But then you have the Ashkenaz, or at the time, well, I won't get into it because it's a sore point for people, but there, were, there was a Jewish empire at the time in that other part um, called the Iberian or Iberia. Um, so, you know, there's something to talk about there. We won't get into it here. Um, we'll continue. We'll stay on track. So, but just remember that our pack said we got Salah and Salah we got Eber, the progenitor of the Hebrews. And that means to cross over, which means the Gentiles are called Gentiles because they don't cross over. The children of Eber are the ones that cross over and it's, and it's related to the promised land. Ultimately, the children of Israel, who are descendants of Eber, are the ones who fulfill this prophecy. And they cross over the Jordan into the promised land. But really, what are, what, the promised land, the, the true promise is eternal life, of which the promised land is just symbolic of eternal life and crossing from life, from death into life, right? And so that's something that's promised to uh, the believers, right? Crossing from death into life. Much as Joshua led the children of Israel over the Jordan from, from essentially death into life, into the promised land. So there's a lot going on here, a lot of prophetic things going on. I won't belabor it here. We'll, we'll dig into it in another video, like I said. But it's something to think about because the scriptures are written on so many levels that... You know, it's it's hard to just, you know, just relegate it to just a, being a book. So anyways, um, I think I'll cut it off here. But just uh, remember that uh, race is a construct. The Bible talks about the 70 nations and ethnicities. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself brought to desolation in every city or house divided against itself shall not stand listen America pay attention so we're going to close it out here and I just want to say I love you all so much and thank you so much for continually supporting my content if you did enjoy this video hit the thumbs up button subscribe and turn on the notification bell and share this with your friends and family I'm sure they'd find it interesting as well I'm very excited to continue this journey with you, and I thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated about certain events around the world. I very much appreciate you all, and a shout out to the channel members. I uh, would keep growing, and I appreciate that so much. And more importantly, everybody has a blessed, a beautiful blessed day within the body of Messiah. Yahusha, Hamashiach, and I'll see you all in the next video.